Praise God, praise God, praise God. So good morning and happy Lord's Day once again. And uh, just so happy to be able to preach from God's Word. You know I love to preach. I love to preach. And so I love to preach from His Word because the truth is, is there is nothing quite like the Bible. Is. There is no book on this planet that is amazing as this book is. And I know we already talked about it a little bit, but let me just remind you, no matter what circumstances you have going on in your life, I just want you to put those on pause. To just put those on pause, put your attention on God, not on me, but on God and on His Word, and understand this very fact, that God has a word for every one of you, for everything you're going through. I'm not um, blind to the fact that every one of you has something going on in your life right now. God knows it all, and He has a word for you. So I invite you to hear from one that He has to say to you today. Today, what we're going to be discussing is holiness. <coughs> holiness. It's a word we talk about a lot. It's a word we sing about a lot. But what exactly does that mean? Now, specifically in holiness, what we're going to talk about is the way it relates to the church family. I believe that this is the ingredient that the majority of churches are missing in this planet, in this country, across the globe. And you see, what do you mean by that? Uh, I believe that holiness is more important than giving. I believe holiness is more important than Bible memorization. I believe that holiness is more important than perfect attendance. I believe that God makes it clear that holiness is essential and that it is the fuel to invite the Holy Spirit to use our church to slay the giants that are walking in this world. And so it has to begin with holiness. So what does holiness mean to you? Just think about that for a minute. When I say holiness, what picture is coming to your mind? See, for me, and I have it on the screen for you. The Bible teaches that holiness means being set apart and devoted to God. It involves living a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, focused on following God's design for how things should be in this world. Now, I know some of you are looking at your sermon notes. You say, Pastor, this is not the right sermon. I had a different sermon at the beginning of the week, and when I gave that to our secretary, Ms. Deborah, that was the sermon I was going to preach, and God said, nope, change up, and so that's why but you've got plenty of room to write these notes in if you'd like. And so that's what the Bible teaches about holiness. And so with that in mind, how would you describe a holy person? How would you describe a holy person? What people come to mind. See, for me, some people that come to mind, and you know, we talked about a little bit in Sunday school. Y'all know how much I love George Mueller. For me, uh, Adrian Rogers, Billy Graham. Were these godly people? Yes. Were they perfect people? No, but oh boy, I believe they were holy. How would you describe a holy person? Or what about a holy church? How would you describe a holy church? A church that lines up with them right there. Set apart, devoted to God. Living a life empowered by the Spirit, focused on following God's design for how things should be. For those of you who are Christians, how often do you purposefully pursue holiness in your day-to-day -day life? Because that's what we're, we're called to. We're going to get into that. We're, we're called to pursue holiness. What obstacles or distractions are constantly preventing you from prioritizing holiness in your life? Having witnessed the blessings that come from a church family that's centered around living holy. Or have you seen the consequences that come from a church family focused on everything but their own holiness? If you haven't guessed yet, the title of the day's sermon is Holiness. And the subtitle is Constructing a Stronger Church Together. Because I believe God wants us to be a strong church, but he wants us to be a strong church in his eyes, not in our eyes, not in the world's eyes, not in the convention's eyes, not in other churches' eyes, but in his eyes. And it begins and it ends with the word holiness. So there are two things I want you to know today. The first thing is this, and it's on your screen. The key to a strong and healthy church family in God's eyes is holiness. 
1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. I'll give you your time. It will be up on the screen, but I don't know many of you like to turn your pages. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. See, Peter encourages believers that are facing persecution to pursue holiness as a reflection of their identity in Christ. In response to God's holiness. See, we read this and we go, be holy in that. Oh, wow, that's, that's some heavy stuff. But you may have not known that that's who Peter was writing to. Persecuted people. Be holy as I am holy. He's called you to be holy. Be holy. So, what I would tell you is this what I would hope that you would get from this is as a church body, we never have an excuse to not be pursuing holiness. You say, but you don't know what happened to me. God does. You say, but you don't know what happened to my family. You don't know what diagnosis I've just received. God does. You don't know how busy I am and how hard it is for me to get to church. God does, and God will make a way. I remember one of the harder things I had to do as a young, I think I might have been 19 at the time, and I was a uh, basically on, on track to be the assistant manager of the video store that I was working at. And they made it clear that in order for me to do that, that I would have to work on Sundays and I would have to work on Wednesdays. And I remember struggling with that because I would have made a significant pay raise. And I, luckily, I had a godly person in my life, spoke into my life, and, and who told me, what does God want you to do? And so I prayed over it. And so, I, it didn't take much prayer because God, I mean, he's clear. We're to worship on Sunday. We're to worship on the Lord's Day. We're to worship with our church family without excuse. We're to make that a priority in our lives. Not perfect attendance, but a priority. And so I told my boss, I said, I appreciate the offer, but I'm going to have to decline if it means that I'm going to have to work on the Lord's Day and if I'm going to have to work on Wednesday nights. And the reason why Wednesday nights was important is because I was serving in the youth ministry at the time. And so I had to do that. And you know what? I got the job anyway. And you know what? God blessed that. And I had a great relationship with my boss. I wonder what it would have been like if I had not pursued holiness and instead I just said, you know what, I'm going to compromise. See, that's what we're called to do is pursue holiness. No matter what's going on in our lives. I know that you understand that churches can be frustrating. I get it. I've been a frustrated pastor before. I've been frustrated in our church before. And you've been frustrated in me before, right? We have all these things going on. But the thing is, is holiness is an essential. It's an essential thing. The second thing I want you to know is this. Holiness should be your top priority above all other pursuits in your life. Now, I'm kind of hinted at that already. But before we talk more on that, let's read Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It's the first book in the New Testament. About three quarters of your way through the Bible. It's right there sandwiched in between the Sermon on the Mount. The Bible says, but seek first, say first, the kingdom of the world. What does it say? The kingdom of God. So it doesn't say, but seek first your kingdom. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not tradition. His righteousness. And all these things be provided for you. You see, Jesus teaches that seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness should be our primary focus in life. That trusting him to provide for our needs as we seek him, as we desire to be more like him. You see, what is holiness? It's striving to be more like Jesus. That's what holiness really is in the simplest term. Striving to be more like Jesus. But can we do that in our own power? Yes or no? No, no that works. We're not at works. We submit to the scriptures and the scriptures say that you will say will. will. You will bear fruit 
when you are focused on the glory of God and you are focused on spending more time with Jesus. Amen. And so this tells us, seek first the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of pleasure. Not the kingdom of our children. Not the kingdom of our jobs. Not the kingdom of our sports. Not the kingdom of this church. We are to seek one kingdom and one kingdom only. And it's his kingdom known as the kingdom of heaven. And when we focus on the kingdom of heaven, and we focus on the righteousness that God will produce in us, all these things will be provided for you. You say, I don't know how I'm going to be able to live in this house. We may not be supposed to stay in the house. I don't know if I'll be able to keep this job. God will provide your needs. It may not be that job. You say, I, I don't know if the school will fire me if I speak up whenever it's speaking lies. Who cares? Because our focus is to be on whose glory? Our focus is to be pleasing whom? God. Not pleasing your mother, not pleasing your father, your wife, your husband, your children. Pleasing God. As a matter of fact, I want you to listen on to this. This little secret is something I learned really quickly in my marriage, and I praise God that I learned it early. If I'm focused on pleasing my spouse, my marriage is going to be a wreck. But when I focus on pleasing God, my marriage is a foundation that is unshakable. Amen. And there are times that pleasing God goes against pleasing my spouse, and I have to be okay with that. And she's got to deal with that, and then we deal with that. There are other times where, where my desires are not lining up with his, and she has to say, no, James, this is not of God. Praise God for marriage. I praise God for children. I praise God for the church. I praise God for the calling to be a husband, to be a father, to be a pastor. It's important for you to know those two keys on holiness because, number three, a church family that pursues holiness will receive blessings from God. A church family that pursues holiness will receive, say will, will. not might, will receive blessings from God. Now, before we talk about the blessings, I want to read the passage I have for you, because some of you are picturing blessings in the wrong way. So let's look at uh, Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. That's about halfway through your Bible. Um, it's the very first chapter of the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bear its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. Now, there have been a lot of people on your TV and in some books on the internet that told you that God wants you to be rich and it's stupid and it's not found in the Bible. Unless we're talking about God wants you to be rich in Him. You see, what is a blessing? I can be receiving blessings if I am in Iraq and if I am shackled and I am being tortured for my faith in Christ, which happens every single day, and I can still be receiving blessings because I have the joy of the Lord. I can receive blessings when I have people attack me for my beliefs on social media. I can receive blessings when I may not have a full bank account, but I have a full spiritual account. How happy. How, how many of you have tried to, to be happy? Especially if you've ever tried to How does that work out? 
It always makes you miserable, doesn't it? Like it made me get a little bit because I'm like, ooh, that's it, right? When you're pursuing holiness, you experience happiness that's beyond belief and that lasts longer than you can even imagine. Why? Because when you're pursuing becoming more like Jesus, he does the rest. We've been taught, and I know why I hammer this down, but we've been taught it's in our works, it's in us doing it. No, that's ridiculous. It's in us submitting. When you come to the scriptures, you're not saying, all right, God, here I am. You're saying, God, I can't wait to know you more. You're saying, God, I can't wait for you to use this, the sword, the shield, the living word, and change me from the inside out. Whatever you want to work on today, Lord, have at it. You pray a prayer like that and watch what happens. Watch all the idols that are being revealed in your life. And you're going, oh my goodness. And God's saying, give it to me. Give it to me. And you'll never regret giving it to him, but you will regret holding on to him. And when you give them to him, not only do you give them to him, he gives you something back. He gives you more of himself. And then all of a sudden, people in your life are going, why are you not panicking? You just lost your job. It's because my faith is not in my job. My faith is in my God. Amen. You say, why are you panicking? The country is going to this and to this and the Democrat Party and the Republican Party and they're a mess. And why aren't you panicking? I'm not panicking because my faith is in God. Amen. My faith is not in the church. My faith is not in you. My faith better not be in me. I told you, I've disappointed myself more than anybody on the planet has. Our faith must be in God. And when we are having our faith in God, we receive the blessings that come. And one of the most beautiful blessings is the joy of the Lord and the peace that surpasses all understanding. That fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about this in Galatians 5, you get that when you do John 15 and just abide in the vine. Yeah. Awesome. One of the things I want to talk about just quickly is one of the things I see, and, and, and again, I've done it, I was taught it, is we like to make a habit, say habit. We love to make a habit of making decisions and then saying, God bless my decisions. <laughs> God, I decided to get this job. It brought more money. God, I decided to buy this boat. I, God, I decided to buy those shoes. God, I decided, you're saying buy shoes, what? You need to pray over everything because everything belongs to him. He doesn't serve you. You are here to serve him. And when you do that, you're going to have so much more joy and satisfaction in life. But when you're focused on getting yours, then you're focused on everybody else getting yours, and you're like, uh-uh, I need more. I need more. And you find yourself knee-deep in debt, enslaved to the government, enslaved to credit card companies. You need to cut those things up. You need to live on what God has given you. You need to give back to God on what he's given you. And then what you need to do is you need to say, God, I'm going to pay these debts off, and I know you're going to pay quicker than I ever could. Holiness is not a word that we sing about. It's a lifestyle that we're called to live. Holiness. What we're really called to do is this. God... Do I need these shoes? God, do, do I need a boat? Sometimes the answer is going to be yes, guys. It's okay. God, do, do we need this house? God, do I need that job? God, is this going to be best for my marriage? Some of you, your marriages are on rocks because you took a job and you thought it was going to help your marriage, and then and instead it brought you further apart. And what you need to do is say, Lord, what would you have me do? And then you need to do it. And that you'll provide the rest. Amen? Amen? Another reason why it's important for you to know those two keys on holiness is because neglecting holiness will result in God's judgment rather than his blessings. Let me remind you, discipline, conviction from God is a good thing. If you are a believer in Christ, you should expect that when you are sinning, specifically when you're sinning unrepentantly, even more specifically when you're celebrating the sin that you're sinning, that he is going to bring conviction and he is going to bring discipline and it is for your good. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 30. 
and 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30 to 32. Y'all don't even know. God's been working this sermon on my on me all week. The sermon has been changed four times. Because God's like, I woke up, I, I went to bed last night, feeling great. Woke up this morning, God said, it's not finished. I was like, all right. Because this is what we need. If we get holiness right, we get so much other things correct too. If we get holiness wrong, ooh. This is why the Apostle Paul was writing to the Corinthians. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that, say so that, so that, so that we may not be condemned with the world. His discipline, his correction, his conviction is to bring us back to his steps. Yes. Because when we're in his steps, we're right where we need to be. And when we're out of his steps, we're right where we're not supposed to be. We're going to experience the consequences. How many of you have experienced the discipline of God before? Praise God. Praise God I lost that job. Praise God I didn't get that job. Praise God. Why? Because I would rather be poor as dirt and full of the Spirit than the richest person in the world in the Spirit. See, his conviction comes, his discipline comes, and, and it doesn't just happen to the Corinthians. Let me remind you, you don't need to turn there, but let me remind you about the seven letters. There are seven letters in the book of Revelation, if you read it right. Now, I personally believe these were real churches, and if, you're, if you don't know this, they were written into the postal order that the postman would have brought them, right? And so not only that, but I also believe that these seven churches are the representation of what we see in churches throughout the church age. And we're living in the church age. And so when we see this, here's what we have. We have the church in Ephesus. What was the church in Ephesus all about? Well, the church in Ephesus had forsaken their first love. And Jesus warned them to repent or else he would remove their legs. Let's keep going, shall we? The church in Smyrna, who I love the church in Smyrna, because it had no specific sins mentioned, but they were encouraged to endure persecution and be faithful until death with the promise of a crown of life. The church in Pergamon had some who held to the teachings of false teachers, mostly about sexual teachings, and Jesus warned them to repent or else he would come and fight against them with the sword of his mouth. The church in Thyatira tolerated the woman Jezebel who led some into sexual immorality and idolatry. Jesus warned them to repent or else he would come and throw them into a great tribulation. The church in Sardis had a reputation for being alive, busy with programs. They, they had all these things going on, but they were spiritually dead, Jesus said. And Jesus urged them to wake up and strengthen what remained or else he would come like a thief. The church in Philadelphia had no specific sins mentioned, praise God. Instead, they were commended for keeping his word and being faithful in persecution. And Jesus promised to keep them from the hour of trial that was coming upon the whole world. Did you know that there's going to be a judgment? And you can disagree with me on eschatology if you want, but I believe there's going to be a rapture and his church is going to go up and that there's going to be seven years of tribulation. Three and a half a trip, and three and a half a great trip, and it's going to be hell on earth. Yes. And God is going to unleash his wrath on this earth, bit by bit. And did you know Jesus, when he told people about the gospel, when he told people the truth, he told them about hell. We don't need to scare people into heaven, but by golly, we need to let them know that hell is a real place that you don't want to be. And that instead of hell... You don't just get heaven because that's just a perk. That's a benefit. You get Jesus. You get the blood that was shed on the cross. The righteousness of Jesus Christ covers you when you give your life to him. The church of Laodicea, where lukewarm, oh, goodness. They were neither hot nor cold. You say, oh, like, 
hot on fire for the Lord and cold. No, no, that's not what this text is saying at all. See, they traveled their water because the water was so far away. They had to travel it through pipes from far away. By the time the water got there, it was neither hot nor cold. It was lukewarm, and it was bleh. So we all taste this hot new water sometimes, you know? <laughs> there have been some mornings where it was a little bit funky. And what Jesus says is you're useless. And he warned them that he would spit them out of his mouth if they did not repent and be zealous for God. God takes holiness and the lack thereof very seriously in his churches. There are far, like I shared with you, I believe the Bible is true. I believe that the Bible is very clear that uh, women are not called to serve as pastors. But I'll tell you what else I believe, that there are many men that are in pulpits that have no business being in there. Because do you know what the majority of the Bible talks about when it talks about the qualifications of a pastor? It talks about his character. Amen. It talks about his character. That the pastor should be striving for holiness. The pastor should be striving for Christ's likeness. And the way that the pastor goes is the way that the church is going to go. That's why I invite you. I need accountability because I know that James without accountability is not a good situation. But so do you. I think I was talking about the Sunday school. I might have brought another church. I can't remember which. I, I had a, a, a church member from another church come and, and, and talk to me. You know, church members love to do that. They love to go and talk to another pastor. They didn't even know pastor. And they come and talk to me and say, you won't believe what pastor so-and-so did. So-and-so church. I said, what did I do? They were preaching about da -da -da -da, knowing that this was going on in our church. I said, good. My job is not to please you. My job is to please the Lord by preaching the truth of his word and telling you what you need to hear even though you don't want to hear it. Amen. Mm. Because God does it to me all week, so by God, you should hear it for one hour, right? <laughs> Guys, if we get this right, <coughs> we're going to talk about what we have to do. I believe you and I should, as a church, prioritize holiness as we seek to align ourselves with God's perspective. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I think this is a beautiful picture of holiness, a beautiful picture of unity. For sake of time, I'm going to read it. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that you were called, and one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Paul urges the Ephesian believers to live in a way that matches their calling, highlighting the significance of unity, humility, and love, and keeping peace among them. As a church, we should actively pursue unity and love and holiness. This is what the church is supposed to be. I also believe you and I should, number six, as a church, embrace the authority of God's word, reject sin in ourselves and our church family, and live with an eternal perspective, recognizing that our true home is heaven. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light and a light on my path, to my path, whatever your translation says, it says the same thing. It said, guide me. Now, I came across this passage. I wasn't planning on using this verse till this morning until God said, this is what you do. I was like, all right. Uh, I came across this commentary, and, and I, it just opened up this passage so much more to me. Warren Wearsby, uh, many of you never heard of him. I would encourage you to get his commentary. He's an awesome commentary. He's a pastor of pastors. And I don't agree with everything he says, but I don't agree with everything I've said in my life. 
And so, Warren Wearsby says this, the ancient world did not have lights such as we have today. The people carried little clay dishes containing oil, and the light illuminated the path only one step ahead. We do not see the whole route at one time, for we walk by faith when we follow the word. Each act of obedience shows us the next step, and eventually we arrive at the appointed destination. You're going, Lord, help me know what to do five years from now. When he's saying, why don't you just ask me what to do right now? And then when you do that, then do it again. And then do it again. And then do it again. And when you make a pattern, and when you make a habit of it, you hear the Lord so much better, which is part of our faith. We make it all safe, then I call it. All right? You and I should prioritize holiness, embrace God's word, reject sin, and live with an eternal perspective because pursuing holiness within the church body opens the door for hearing from God more frequently and more clearly. John 10, 27. John 10, 27. It says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I got to tell you, church, there have been many a times where I have tried my best to be in my sin and to close out the voice of God. It's impossible. You can quiet the voice of God. The Bible calls that quenching the Holy Spirit. But you cannot shut up the voice of God once you become a believer in Christ. I've shared with you before, the Bible does not tell you that when you give your life to Jesus that it will change your will-to's, it will change your what? Want-to's. All of a sudden, you're desiring things that you never desired before. Doesn't mean you're going to do it, but you have a desire for it. You can't even explain it. It's because you're made new, the Bible says. When she hear my voice, I know them and I follow them. And they follow me. You wanna you wanna hear from Jesus more? And, and I've shared with you the secret, the secret sauce. I've been sharing with you in the month about a month or two now. So let me remind you, before you open this, bow your head and invite the Lord to speak to you. Through. Say, Lord, clear of all the distractions. I only want to hear from you. And then once you're reading, you stop. You don't try to get through a chapter of the Bible. What you do is you stop when that verse jumps off the page at you, and you pray through that verse. I'm not telling you there's anything wrong with reading the Bible. I'm telling you, though, don't get in the habit of just reading it. Let it read you. Amen. And so you go, oh, man, I did not realize that was sin. Lord, forgive me. Oh, I need to pray for that person right now. And you stop and you pray. And then when you're done, you move to the next person. You keep going. And then when you're done, you, you close that book. You put your hand on that book. I just, I just like to put my hand on the physical book. I love the Bible. And so, and you say, Lord, don't let me leave any of this behind. Keep it with me. Use me for your glory. You tell me that reading the Bible is boring when you do it that way. When you center it not around your wants and your desires, but you center it completely around the glory of God. Amen? Amen. You won't have a problem hearing from God. You might be like, all right, Lord, I heard you. <laughs> I never got to that. I just want more of him. I want more of him, which means he must increase, but I must increase. And so in order to get more of him, I've got to cut more and more of the world out of my life. And I do not and will never be ready. What I do regret is the times when you go back to these things. Another important reason why you and I should prioritize holiness, embrace God's word, reject sin, and live with eternal perspective is because a pursuit of holiness enables the church body to experience God working in remarkable ways, accomplishing the seemingly impossible for his glory. This is what I wanted to drive into. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. And I want you to get there. Uh, if you're if you're opening your Bible, give me time to get there. Because this is what I was driving you to. Now 
down to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. There's something missing in our church. To be honest with you, there's something missing in my own life, in most of our lives. And the Lord convicted me of that this week. Our church should not just be seeing people come to Jesus and get baptized and come to church. We should see situations happening where other people are looking in at this and saying, there's no way that James had a hand in that. The Highland New Baptist didn't do that. There's no way that that little church did that. I am here to tell you the reason that we're not experiencing those moments is because we won't get out of the way. What did Peter have to do in order to walk on water? Right. But he also had to get off the boat. He had to leave the boat behind. And then he had to keep his eyes on the moon. And when he took his eyes off Jesus, what did he do? And when he called out for, for salvation, when he called out not for salvation, but out for, for saving him, when he called out, what happened? And Jesus looked at him in the eyes and said, Why did you doubt? Church. Our lack of reverence for God, our lack of holiness, our lack of prioritizing holiness in us and in this church body is the reason we're not seeing more God moments in our church and in our lives. So from here on out, as long as I'm the pastor of this church, however long God wants us to be, we're going to focus on being a church that is known holy. Why? Because that's a church that pleases God. And that's a church that God's going to use us to slay a lot of giants. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what about you right now in this invitation time? What are you supposed to do? Well, I would tell you, you can take a moment. Reflect. Don't just start singing the song. Reflect. Reflect on the sermon. Reflect on the word. Consider how God wants you to apply this message to your life today. Think about areas where you may need to ask God's forgiveness. You need to ask for his guidance. You may need to ask for renewal. If you feel led, respond in prayer. Come and pray. There's nothing special about this place. Pray where you are. It doesn't matter. God's everywhere in this room. If you just need to come down, you want me to pray with you, I'll pray with you. Pray for you. Maybe this is a time where you need to publicly respond and you need to say, I need to rededicate, I need to reorient. Basically, I need to repent as a believer in Christ and I need to get back on the path that God has for me. Don't do that quietly so Satan can keep tearing you down and knocking you at the knees when you say, I'll do better. No, you won't. The Bible says that we are to publicly call things out. Why? So that Satan cannot keep bringing things out of the darkness because we've already put it out of the light. You want to do better? You want to be more like Jesus? Invite your church to be a part of that experience. Some of you, you need to be baptized. The Bible says that once you place your faith in Christ, you're going to be baptized, as the scriptures say. And so you need to be baptized. There's no, oh, I don't feel like it. I don't care. God doesn't care. He tells you to do it if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So you need to stop and you say, but I'm afraid of the water. I get that. I do. But you need to just surrender your fears to Jesus and understand you won't regret doing so. Come on and talk to me. I'd love to help you in that. Some of you, you need to, you need to be a member. God's been calling you to be a member, so you've been talking about being a member for years now. God wants you to be a member of this church body. Why? Not so that you can get out of us, but so that you can be held accountable. See, that's the beautiful thing about a church body is that church membership brings accountability. So that you can help us be better and we can help you be better in Jesus. And so if you want to become a member, come down. We'll, we'll begin that process and I'll talk with you about that. 
Some of you, you need to be serving. You've been sitting in the pew. God's called you to serve. You have so many gifts. God's wanting you in children's ministry right now, and you're nowhere near it. God's wanting you in youth ministry right now, and you're nowhere near it. God's wanting you to go witness into this community, and, and you're nowhere near it. God wants you to help me fall in love with the people that come and visit the church, and you're nowhere near it. God wants you serving in the choir. God wants you singing songs. God wants you God wants you to use the gifts, the talents, the passions that he's given you for his glory. Amen? Amen. Do it. Don't wait. You only regret waiting. Some of you, I haven't said this before in this church, I, I am genuinely saying, forgive me. Some of you have been called to the ministry and you have been ignoring that call partly because I haven't mentioned that call to you. Some of you men, God is calling to be pastors. God will provide. I love to have that conversation with you. Whatever you invite you to follow the Holy Spirit, I'm going to lead you and guide you. Lastly, for those of you who don't know Jesus, yet. The reason I say yet is because here's another opportunity. And I'm not talking about believe. I'm saying no. Remember, when we read the Bible, when it talks about that word believe, it's not talking about, oh, I believe in this. It's saying that you put your chips in. You are leaning that chair back, and the only thing holding it up is those two legs. You're going all in on God through his son, Jesus Christ. If you've never made that decision, I'd love to help you with that. I'd love to talk with you more about that. If you're ready to, to publicly, maybe you've been quietly thinking about it, or maybe you quietly made the decision, but you haven't told anybody. The Bible says publicly, put it out in the light. So if you need to do that, you do that. And if nobody comes down here, guess what? God is still good. God is still sufficient. And I've done my job. Now do yours. By your me. Heavenly Father, I love you. And I praise you. Lord, I thank you. This, this, this isn't about me. This is about you. This isn't about us. This is about you. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for not taking holiness seriously, for not taking you seriously, for not taking your word seriously. Lord, I pray that everyone in this room will realize that you're already here and you have a desire. You have a word for them and you've been telling them, but now it's time for them to do something with it. It's time for them to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whatever it is. Yes, Lord. Because I know that you will provide whatever you call me to. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen.